We've also had the pleasure of having Paulette be one of the teachers with uh, classes that are, we offer online here through the festival. And uh, she's taught a couple um, online uh, history classes, one of which was uh, a, a contributing to her research for an upcoming publication by Rutledge called The Object Performance in the Black Atlantic, colon, the United States. So without further ado, I pass the baton to Paulette. Okay. Thank you, Blair. Thank you, uh, everyone who got up this morning and came out for the symposium panels. There's been so many excellent shows, and uh, this is down towards the end of the festival, so we're um, in our last energy reserve, but we're going to make it worth your while for coming out today. So the format will be, um, I will briefly describe the theme of the panel. Then I will introduce our first presenter, which will be John Young. And we'll come down the row this way, with each presenter having about 15 minutes. And then the, we will have a discussion between the panel members, um, linking their remarks and shows, which some of you have seen, to the theme of the panel. And then we will open the floor for questions from the audience. I hope you will participate with us um, because this is really an, an inquiry, it's not a lecture. And there are microphones on either aisle there. So when we do open the floor for questions, please come forward and you'll be able to pose your question there. Okay, let me switch out um, and pull up my notes. Because I wrote this stuff a couple months ago. <laughs> So Maya, the uses of illusion. Hindu cosmology regards the material world as Maya, illusion. It's, uh, it does strange things to my computer and I cannot see, so I'm gonna amp up the, okay, now I can see. <laughs> okay, yes. The soul's journey to enlightenment is a process of awakening from the illusion that our impermanent material existence is separate from the divine consciousness. Maya, therefore, also encompasses the wondrous creativity of the gods who brought forth and maintain the material world. Western theories, such as Graham Harmon's Object-Oriented Ontology, that's the name of the author and the book, so you can go check that out if you would like to later. Um, they similarly conclude that while humans are not the only agents in the universe, we can only enter into the reality of the material world outside our own consciousness through metaphor. So we are always telling ourselves stories about um, our encounters with the material world and what is this thing, and what is its purpose or function in the world. That's a story that we're making up for ourselves, illusion. So Harmon turns to aesthetics rather than science for new tools of knowledge creation, and that's where we artists come in, and that's why um, object-oriented ontology is gaining such traction in the art world. Puppets, masks, and performing objects can be powerful implements in this endeavor because they function as three-dimensional metaphors that explode Cartesian dualism. So Descartes is the, um, divides the world into self and other, body, mind, all of these hierarchized dichotomies. So looking at things from the perspective um, that we're addressing today enables us to apprehend, that's another word that the phenomenologists, the students of consciousness like to use. So how we apprehend material objects as subjects in their own right. And any of us who have ever wrestled with a puppet that wants to turn left when we need it to turn right, uh, then we understand that negotiation with material. So 
without further ado, I will introduce Jani Young, and then we'll launch her presentation. So, we're very fortunate to have Jani Young here today from South Africa. She is a director and producer of multimedia, theatrical, and visual performance works with an emphasis on puppetry arts. Jani's work has been performed widely internationally in North and South America, Africa, Europe, India, and the East. A director of the Handspring Puppet Company for four years, she currently runs Jani Young Productions. And she also directs Unima South Africa. Unima is the Union Internationale de la Marionette. That is the international puppetry organization dedicated to um, creating friendship through puppetry around the world. Um, so, Jani is the leader of UNIMA in South Africa, and she uh, also focuses on social development through visual performance mediums. In 2018, Jani was a Granada artist in residence at the University of California in Davis, where she co-directed an interpretation of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye with Margaret L. Kemp. Young and Kemp reprised this production at last year's Chicago International Public Theater Festival. And some of you may have seen that show. It was excellent. Jani is a graduate of the French National School of Public Theater. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Fine Art and a Master of Arts in Theater. So I'm just going to pull up her presentation materials and you can take it away. See that? You can't see that, so that's fine. I'm going to read it to you anyway. <laughs> I'm just going to read this one part because I want to try and say it correctly. So, um, the puppet. Puppet is a representation creating the illusion of the animate in the inanimate. It's a thing that's brought up. We all know that. Um, the representation is an automatically metaphorical act because we're saying one thing is another. We're creating a parallel being. Um, it's a transparent metaphor. We see both the illusion and its source, allowing a direct engagement with the act of creating identity. Every human mind is engaged in a great act of creation. We're continually, we, continues in, we continually invest belief in a fixed reality, including the idea of the self. So, you know, the philosophy that we talked about, um, the Hindu philosophy, um, talks about this, uh, this ultimate reality where, in fact, we are one with, the, the, with each other, with the being of the, the divine. But really, in our everyday world, what we relate to is I, me, 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 my things, stuff, where I am, this is my world. It's all about that. And even those of us that are really interested in these philosophical ideas, I just mean myself, uh, it, it, it's not something that we can continually process. Because right here and now, there's this mic stand in front of me, and I'm sitting here, and there's art sitting here talking to you. So that is the constant space that we're in, creating and fixing an idea of I in a real world, which in fact is an illusion, um, as all of these philosophies tell us. Most of us don't perceive this act of creation. It's a continuous act of creation that we're engaged in. So um, this, this is kind of the ultimate suspension of disbelief. For those of you who are really in the puppet field, you know we love to talk about the suspension of disbelief. People know that the puppet is not real, but they suspend, they, they put aside that disbelief and invest their emotions in the reality that's being created on stage. And uh, for the period that they are engaged in it, believe in it. 
that we are the masters of the suspension of disbelief in our own lives. We do it all day, every day. But the suspension is so complete that we're really very often completely unaware of the creative act involved in that. Um, so this, this ultimate suspension of uh, disbelief leads to certainty, which I believe certainly is one of, is, is our greatest threat in negotiating the fragile space of our humanity. So for me, um, and I think I'm not alone in this, but that I think that when we believe with certainty, I am, this is, they are, this is the boundary, this is the border, this is who we are, this is ours, this is yours. Those kind of um, concepts of certainty are the source of many of the conflicts and um, uh, situations that lead to, lead to disharmony amongst ourselves and between us and our beautiful world. So that's why I talk about certainty being a threat. So the human investment in the illusion of a fixed living identity is directly and visibly mirrored in the puppet life metaphor. The heart of my work has always been to scratch at the edges of the illusion of a stable and unified reality, to provoke a glimpse of the fluidity between ourselves, our identities, and our, world, and our world. I see the purpose of my work being to open the dynamic space of uncertainty that I experience to be the vibrant heart of being human. So that's the blah blah that I wanted to read to you. Now, <laughs> close this. And I'm just going to talk about a few of my shows to give you a sense of how I do that in practical reality. This is the easier part. <laughs> so we're going to go on to the, <laughs> um, the pictures. So the very first work that I created after graduating from the French National School of Puppetry Art was my master's thesis, well it wasn't the first one, but it was the first significant work for me. Uh, it was my master's thesis production and it was, the thesis was on the way puppetry is a mirror for the illusion of self, so very much on the topic that we're talking about today. And the production was called Dollars. It was about a relationship between a young man and a young woman who were engaged in a relationship and were in the fragile space of questioning whether it was time to make a more permanent commitment to each other. It was based on where I was at in my life at the time with my husband. Um, and the way that the um, show started off, perhaps we can see the next slide. I'm, right? I'm trying. Um, I don't know how to scroll down oh. in the document. I might have to get out of here. That, that takes me to the other document. Well, never mind. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. So this particular show, Dollars, um, started off with there are two characters, and each character, the man and the woman, is manipulated by three puppeteers. And all the puppeteers were all the puppeteers were completely covered in black with the cover off, so you couldn't see black gloves. The whole thing, so they were invisible. And in the beginning, we see this relationship between this man and woman developing and you know things are going well but as things start to some conflict comes into the relationship we start to see the manipulators removing their cuggles and entering into conflict with each other about how they want the body the person to act with the other person and eventually all of them are totally like undressed and they've got bras on and they're shouting they're wrestling they fight they pull the puppets into pieces and then finally uh, and towards the end of the production, they, they, they have, they're completely all puppets are in pieces all over the floor, and all, the puppeteers are all sort of <laughs> exposed, and they somehow see the mess that they've created of themselves and each other, and they start to put the puppets back together and find a way towards re-entering the relationship. And finally, they actually get married, and when they, when they turn, their wedding garments are all the, all the, all the things, the baggage that you know, we've sort of encountered in the course of the play is trailing off behind them. Anyway, so the, the, that particular production was, what we saw was the manipulators exposed more and more in the course of the production as forces acting on the puppets. And the next, so that's Dolos, then Barbaros, um, it was a production that uh, the, the puppeteers were exposed all the way through and they were in a kind of a neutral brownish color and they uh, 
were like the forces behind the characters, but they didn't play a direct role, like a character role, as they did in, in Dallas. In Arborous, what we saw was in the beginning of the show, you have the impression that you're seeing a lot, a lot of different stories about different people. But in fact, what it was was one, one story with five different versions of the same people. So you have man and woman, and you've got a, 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 a man, an adult person, a child, a baby, an old person, and a dead person. And so somehow in the beginning, you're seeing these, these characters interacting, and it looks like a whole lot of different people. You think there's a child and his father, but then, as the relationship between the man and the woman develop, you realize that the, the thing that's blocking them from being in a relationship is that the child doesn't trust the, the woman and it's hidden the man's heart. So it, it, it was, a, it, it, and uh, there's a whole lot of other complexities involved in the whole relationship. And somehow the two children have to find a way, the child from within the woman and the child from within the man have to find a way to reach a resolution over this heart and, and you know, whether, whether he, the little boy has to decide whether he can trust the girl with the heart, basically. Um, and then when that is resolved, the woman is able to die. So it, it ties together life and death and the process of, of interaction. And in, in that production, what I was really looking at is how ourselves across time and space, how we act on ourselves. How we've gone through something when we're young and then that thing is a thing that we're carrying with us, that way of being, or that anxiety, or that, uh, that care even for ourselves, that concern for ourselves, sometimes invisible to us, but it's within us, causing us to act and react in ways that are or sometimes quite mystifying to ourselves. Uh, that was a, a sort of idea going on behind the, the show, and then the, the story was once again, it was a relationship story. Um, in that, uh, oh look, there's Robbers on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to go back a couple of pictures, I'll just show you, I only have two pictures of Dollars. That's Dollars, the two in the beginning, and you can probably maybe not see it all, but the manipulators are all there, totally in black. And then in the next image, that's the wedding scene, and you see the, the, the manipulators and how they're exposed, and their different uh, ways of being dressed. So, you know, the guy had, for example, he had what we call GQ man, and then he had Doughboy, and then there was, uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was an active guy. So they have different kinds of personalities, these three different manipulators within each one of the characters. Um, all right, now we can go on to Arabras, and that's just a shot to show you, like, the whole family portrait. Um, so you see the two, in fact, it's not the whole family, because you don't see the dead people there. But there we've got the, the children, the baby, the woman, the man, and all their manipulators. The costumes you may recognize, they were repurposed for Hammett. Because <laughs> we're third world. <laughs> we have to sometimes. <laughs> so, okay, we can go to the next one. Um, so that's a little boy in his room. And uh, one of the dynamics in his life is we hear his, his parents arguing in shadow. They're not there present, but they're arguing and he's playing war games in his bedroom and inside that, so he, that's his, him setting up his war games and eventually he can't bear the sound of his parents fighting and he takes off his ears and if you, uh, if you go to the next image, uh, that's him uh, continuing to play and so on, go on. And later on as an adult man, he also takes out his organs, he's a writer and he needs to look at things, so he takes out his heart and he looks at it, he thinks about his lungs and his stomach and so on. And um, that's, in fact, how his heart uh, manages to get uh, taken away by somebody. So, um, go on. This is the old man, also a writer. We have the writer motif coming back to help uh, the audiences to understand that this is, in fact, the same as we saw the color coding of the costumes. Um, somebody said to me afterwards, I really love the show, but I don't understand why you went with, like, the pink and blue. And I was like, oh, my God, I did. How did I do that? And it was really actually that she was red, but when I dyed the clothes, they came out pink. So, <laughs> you know, talking about the hazards of materials and their influence on what happens. You can go to the next image. So there's the man, he actually took, he, as he's examining himself and looking inside himself, 
he pulls himself apart completely and takes off his skin and his face. There he's, he's having a look at himself. But in fact, what he needs to be acknowledging and looking at is this little boy who's running around in his face, trying to get his attention, trying to get him to, trying to be seen, like this interior part that needs to be seen and acknowledged. So he's looking in the wrong places, but getting down to his skeleton. Um, all right, so next image. And there, there the, the, there's another image of the heart. So that's, uh, that's Robert, and I think we're going on to the next show now. Yes, the firebird. So the firebird, uh, based on Stravinsky's firebird, considering uh, what the firebird was about for me, I looked at the original ballet, and there's this, uh, there's this, this force, Kasha, who is, um, uh, who, who kind of, uh, is, a, is a dark and controlling energy that wants to uh, close things down, has, has these demons, um, and then there's also the firebird, which is, a, which is a very creative, energetic, inspiring, passionate energy in the production. And the way that I interpreted the firebird then was almost the opposite now of these previous two shows. The central figure was the human being. So the, the seeker, the central figure, with Prince Ivan in the traditional uh, uh, firebird, became my seeker, who's a woman, a young woman, who is trying to find her voice. And it starts off when she has this relationship with flat and with paper, and you see little bits of paper that emerge from her and begin to form flat like images, and eventually they come towards birds. But then also at the same time, there's the garden of Kasha, there's this sense of, of threat and destruction and criticism that comes in. And all of those images were created with sticks, snakes, and beasts. So the forces of creativity were related to birds and paper. And then the, 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 the forces of um, questioning and anxiety were, uh, were created in, in sticks. And what happened during the course of the production was that these, these forces come into conflict within her and they eventually start to blend with each other. As I investigated more and more what it meant to be creative, it was, in the beginning it was quite a clear cut for me. It was like, wow, the great, the wonderful, beautiful spaces of creativity that we feel the inspiration and then how that gets dragged down by the 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 anxiety and the self-criticism and the you know the, the 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 darker forces that exist within us so it was quite a clearly dichotomized uh, view but as we me and the whole cast delved into the meaning of these two different forces we found that it's actually not the one or the other, duh, right? They're both essentially part of a dynamic that without that questioning, without that re reconsidering and pulling apart, can we really own who we truly are? So the, the, there is the conflict, and then in the end, you have the beasts and the, uh, and, and the sticks and so on, blending with the forces of creativity and emerging as the dragon, which is a mixture of the bird and the, and the beast. And on the back of the dragon is flying the child, which is also another element in the production. That's the fire bird in a nutshell. Now I've run out of time. Okay. So the bluest eye shall have to wait. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you a question about it. I'll ask you a question about it. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you so much. And sorry I was behind hand on the tech. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay. I'll just put the slides down there so we can come back to them later. I can't see my cursor. Here it is. Okay. If I do that, yeah, it's fine. Now I need to open up the folder for our next presenter, Jonathan Meyer. Ah! Oh, no, no, no! <laughs> okay. First, I have to introduce you. So, somatically driven, Jonathan Meyer works to develop an idiosyncratic movement palette, blurring grace and awkwardness, building strange lands that can delight, baffle, and open new possibilities. A gymnast in high school, Jonathan Meyer discovered dance at Oberlin College, where he studied release technique and critical theory with Nusha 
Martinuk, and Ann Cooper Albright. After a capoeira immersion in Brazil with Mestre Medicina, he returned to college to receive an undergraduate degree in dance from UNC Greensboro. Meyer has danced for the high-risk group Pierre-Paul Savoie, Asimina Cremos, and the Seldoms. In addition to dance, Meyer has worked with at-risk youth in wilderness therapy program in Utah, teaching primitive skills, and is a certified practitioner of mind-body centering. Oh yes, we're, we are centered in the uses of illusion here. Okay, yes. In 2002, Meyer founded Ketchery in Taos, New Mexico. In 2006, Meyer moved Ketchery to Chicago, and shortly thereafter, he began his intensive collaboration and partnership with Julia Ray Antonique, with whom he runs the company. Through Ketchery, Meyer and Antonique create and present their own work in addition to choreographing collaboratively. Collaboratively, Meyer has been a CDF lab artist and RDDI participant, and an artist in residence at Gerasi, Bagdale, Hambidge, Abigail, the Kohler Arts Center, Lynx Hall, the Chicago Cultural Center, and the Chicago Park District. It's a great pleasure to have um, the words of wisdom from Jonathan Meyer today. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, I'm actually going to start with, um, if we can cue the video cue. Uh, this is um, from As Though Your Body Were Right, the work that's being presented here at the festival. And uh, just to say, this is actually our first, um, as you heard, we're a dance company, Ketri. Uh, this is our first foray into the world of puppetry. I'm just going to let this roll. It's less than four minutes.
So uh, Janny spoke really uh, wonderfully about this, uh, I think, pretty well-trafficked idea that, um, that we find in, in the art world and philosophy and uh, many other places that the ego, the singular sense of self is in some ways at least illusory. Um, it's a, a functional convenience, uh, necessary perhaps. Um, but also hiding a, a legion of selves, um, aspects of the self, splinters of the id, uh, the ongoing infant, um, the underlying, the animal that underlies the socially vested self. A lot of things maybe tucked away. As emergence theory found its way into popular thought, uh, I got particularly fascinated with this idea that the that the person uh, that, that we as, as individuals, uh, that we're an emergent phenomenon of the blinkered lives of trillions of largely independent cells as if we were better thought of as a, like an ant colony mm -hmm. than a single organism. How can we witness the lives of cells? And how can we choreograph that life? As I started thinking about this piece, uh, I, I first just wanted the audience that close that we could see that kind of infinitesimal, the, the cellular. And originally, I brought in puppets uh, as a framing device. If, if the actor is, is this big, then the, the, the body of the dancer becomes something like terrain or, or environment. And uh, because I knew nothing about the puppetry world, I, I was familiar with Blair's work and reached out to him, and he connected me with Tom Lee, uh, who designed all the puppets and was a, a really integral part of, of helping develop the, the material of the piece and training the puppeteers, um, who actually in this case were from the dance world as well. And this was their first time in, in puppetry. For me, uh, one of the, the many delights of being an artist is that um, kind of repartee between uh, one's vision, I, the word vision, I, I guess I, I want to use art, art, an artist's vision to, to include uh, questions, doubts, passions, conflicts. I, I feel like that the word vision is a bit, it's, it's easy but a bit problematic in a way. Um, but, but whatever it is that's, that's driving the artist, uh, in the, in the creation, um, but, but the, the repertoire between that and the, the increasing life of the work, the, the, the momentum that the work itself gains and um, starts to self-direct and, and, and talk back um, and all that. So at some point uh, for me, it became perhaps less about bodily vulnerability and bodily power, um, though I, I feel that that's still there, uh, but, but maybe at some point it started to gain more of a life that was about relationship and symbiosis, mm -hmm. specifically. And from originally just a framing device, I think that the, the, the puppets and the puppeteer moved to be much more central players. And I think originally I had considered it um, a solo work, but it became very clearly a, a duet, or even at a certain point, uh, a trio between puppet, puppeteer, and dancer. So it's still relevant for me to uh, talk about my interest in choreographing or viewing um, cellular life, but as the work developed, uh, and, and I think particularly in the context of this um, symposium, it became just as interesting for me to, uh, to start to ask, so why, like, why view cellular life? Why do you care? Why is it interesting? <laughs> Um, my studies in body-mind centering offered tools to build the capacity to experience cellular consciousness. The fruits of this are better expressed, I feel, through performed work than any language I can offer here, which is, I guess, another way of saying, come see the work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. The, 
the ills of society or the things that we bemoan, I do, I do feel sometimes we, we maybe speak about them in a, in a particularly individual, um, moral kind of way, like oh, why would somebody do that? Why, why do people behave this way? When arguably, perhaps it's the result of a, of a higher emergent level, the behavior of the superorganism. <laughs> We're not bad people we feel, however blind we may be to choices that we make that cause the unnecessary suffering or even death of individual cells in our body, even whole communities of tissues or organs. If we can experience the cellular in an immediate, visceral kind of way, can we experience the superorganismic can our individual egos step aside for a moment and hear the cellular speak to the superorganismic? This is a question that I feel like has been driving the work that I don't begin to have an answer to, um, but it still feels very uh, potent as a question. And another one that's, that's become really central for me, what is it to see the body? We grow so familiar with a thing sometimes that we no longer see it. It's part of the magic of perception that we come no longer to feel the cane, but to feel the ground through the cane. The fork becomes merely an extension of the fingers or even an extension of the grasp of the mouth. And the utility of all this is, is fabulous. It's, um, it is magical and it's uh, necessary for how we function in the day to day. And I think morally, I, I would say that morality requires us to see a person when we see a human body. But what is it to live in a world where we never see a chair or a house or a plant, but only use them? Or to live in a world where we don't hear the life of language, but only communicate ideas, data, meaning? Or treat each other and ourselves solely as uh, socially successful monolithic beings? Um, Jenny also said something that, that stuck with me that, that's to this point about the threat of certainty or to um, turn it on its head, the value of doubt or the value of possibility, possibilities. So exiting the quotidian if just for a moment, to be briefly a child again, whelmed by the maelstrom of shape, color, sound, the looming, the retreating. Also since uh, kind of being invited to this panel and reading some of Paulette's words that, that she shared earlier, uh, I've been chewing a bit on illusion. Um, I was particularly struck by the, the language about the life and the agency of objects on a literal level, I think that uh, you know, it presents itself to our current sensibilities for the most part as impossible. Um, yet, the impossible is very fecund. We know as performers that there's a magic in escaping ourselves to be someone or something else. And even if that stays with us as the impossible, there's something very uh, potent in that experience, ways of finding other aspects of ourself or um, selves, uh, something like an authentic multiplicity, <laughs> the animal, the child, the cellular, the thousand other people that we could have been or, or perhaps are. And then there's also just 
Um, the really incredibly simple things, the, the spending hours in rehearsal on technical aspects of timing, of exactly how the performer raises a body part and timing with how a puppeteer manipulates a metal rod to create for the viewer this illusion that the body is being magically or magnetically lifted by those rods. And on, on one level, it's a very simple, even childish kind of delight. One that childlike, like playing pretend, we see through at the same time as we fully feel it. It's a profound doorway into aspects of being that resonate with our lived experience, of being moved, of the numinousness that somehow still persists in our world. This is one of the magical capacities of art, that the simplistic, the obvious, the childish can be so profound. There's uh, symbiotic relationships that we, that we have biologically, right? The things that live in and on us that <laughs> genetically perhaps are not us, but arguably are in fact us. Uh, I think about the, the sort of symbiosis between the puppeteer and the puppet or the puppet and the dancer in the context of a work like this or the puppeteer and the dancer. Um, but I, I like thinking about symbiosis too in relationship to the audience's relationship to the work. Um, and I'm gonna end with a, a paraphrase here from Merleau-Ponty, uh, phenomenologist, um, as a way of framing that audience art relationship. Hardness and softness, moonlight and sunlight, present themselves not preeminently as sensory contents, but as a certain kind of symbiosis, certain ways that the outside has of invading us, and certain ways that we have of meeting this invasion. Thanks. <laughs>Okay, hey, you did your homework. <laughs> Great. So, um, oh, and this went offline because it was silent for a minute. Our final presenter is Eduardo Felix, uh, the director of the fabulous Makunaima show, which if you have not seen, you must see. Some of us saw it yesterday evening. And we're still parsing it. Okay. Eduardo Felix, who's coming to us from Brazil, has a degree in sculpture and has been working as a puppeteer and scenographer since 2001. He is the founder and artistic director of the Pigmalion Escultura Que Meche in which he develops his research on puppets, dramaturgy, sound, performance, and teaching of their practices. He has given workshops in Belgium, Spain, France, Italy, Wales, and in several Brazilian cities. He wrote and directed shows such as A Filosofia na Alcoba, O Cuadro de Todos Juntos, Algem, Macunaima, Gourmet, and Brazil. Drawing and watercolor form the basis of his creations. So let me just access his images and we'll yes. be ready to go. Oh, hi. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. I will try to speak a little bit about our process and how, what we try to do but it will be hard for me because my English is terrible. So no. I, I, I hope you understand. Uh, well, the company, the name of the company, Pygmalion Escultura Que Mexe, it's like Pygmalion moving sculpture. I came from sculpture uh, and uh, it was, 
When I started the company, I didn't know if it would be a company of sculpture or theater. And I, I worked already with some other companies, with a, a big company very now in Brazil. Uh, the name is Giramundo. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, there is, yes, it's a company with 50 years of existence. And, uh, but I was a student of art, fine arts. And for me, I would like to make contemporary art. And puppet for me is one thing, contemporary art was other thing. And it was what I learned in the school like the, the puppets are smaller than the other arts. Even in the theater, I think there is a lot of people that thinks really that puppet is smaller than the human theater. And, uh, and I, during a long time for me, it was really separated. I had my career in sculpting, selling things in galleries and uh, but the theater was not, was something that I like, I enjoyed a lot to do. But for me, it was something uh, different. And the, the company starts when I realized that I could make contemporary arts with puppets. It was not so easy to discover that because I have not references. And when I started to have to, to see that, oh, I can really uh, make, what, what I understand as contemporary art, I think it is when you touch, when, you, when, I, when I can speak to my time, when I can interact with my time, with the things, and make people uh, think about some themes and... Uh, to help the society to think about the, the time we, are, we live. And uh, so I, I, when I left uh, the school and I opened my workshop, it was a sculpture workshop in the beginning, and uh, I was trying to say, how can I do something different? And uh, oh, we start from something that I'm, I've not seen yet, puppets with natural size, natural proportions, not like puppets with a big head, or, or, but natural proportions. And after that, I've seen that it was really hard to manipulate these puppets, because when you have a puppet with a, a proportion more uh, caricatural, you can make move. Uh, you can make movements with the puppets less natural, mm -hmm. and when you have a, 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 a real proportion puppet, all the movements has to be really real, and it's hard to do that. And we work more than other techniques with string puppets. It's even more hard to to do. But it was the the beginning, and. We started the first work of the company uh, was uh, an erotic puppet show. It was in 2007. And the initial proposition was to think about philosophy with puppets. It's still in the objectives of the the company, the main of the company, to, to work on philosophy and puppets. And uh, uh, the first big show we did was the a Philosophy in Alcova. She told it's the philosophy in the bedroom, <laughs> the text of Marquise Sad. Oh. And uh, this, it, it was really important for us because we, are, we were talking about uh, philosophy, but also we discovered how to provoke sensations in the public, like the public sensations, like uh, to be horn, 
to be can't breathe when the public to make the public feel angry. Sometimes the public really are angry with us. Even <laughs> here, I can see because <laughs> at the end of the show, Makunaim, I can see a lot of people happy and a lot of people like. <laughs> 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 and I like it because to, to, if if I, I'm trying to touch the contemporary contempt, uh, contemporaneity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it will not be an easy talk. I, I will not talk about just about uh, uh, good things. Uh, uh, and if everybody is happy in the end, it, it didn't work. <laughs> so I don't like, sorry, but I don't like the public happy in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Normally the public leaves the theater like, Ugh, and uh, <laughs> it's what we try to do, it's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I'm lost a little bit. And uh, in this work, we it's a work in a process. This work trying to make uh, realistic movements with puppets. We discovered a re real. There is really a, a illusion. This illusion is something really powerful because uh, uh, when you give the impression that everything, that, that the puppet is alive, it, it's like an hypnotic uh, uh, sensation. It's, the public is open when, even if it, uh, the public doesn't like what I'm saying, but the public listened. It's something powerful when really, it's like, even if sometimes it's like five seconds of this sensation, but this is powerful. So we try to, to make this sensation during more, the more time possible uh, and, uh, and using this to, to make, uh, to provoke, this exist? Mm -hmm. Provoke the public. Mm -hmm. uh, to think about things they don't want to think about. Mm. And so the philosophy in the bedroom was the first big show of the company. We were talking about uh, sexuality and society and the, the rulers of the society. And after we did another show, I think maybe there are some pictures here uh, of the pigs. It's a family of pigs and it's a terrible show like, it's a terrible, <laughs> because, but it's the show we turn more. Uh, uh, it's because uh, it's like a, a respectable family, but you can see inside the head of each character, and it's not easy, because the public will always will identify with one or other story, and maybe, and sometimes it hurts, and I like it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My first show was sad, Marquis is sad, so a little <laughs> bit of sadism is natural. <laughs> uh, so we, we work trying to make this illusion stronger and uh, how can we convince the public that this, the, the puppet is alive? And we started to create, like, to discover, like, a vocabulary of movements because everybody can, you can recognize. We are more prepared than we think to, like, a, like it was. It's like really like a language that we all know very well. The language of gesture. We can. We have. A, you you know if you like or not one person, just by the movements they do. And so we started to, to discover how, what means a gesture, like this, it means one thing, it means other thing, it means one thing, it means, all, so like how to make sentences, like we say that our, we use je word gesture, uh, we, uh, uh, and how to make sentences 
just with movements. And we started like philosophical themes, but after Brazil started to be a, a, a disaster in the political themes. And I, as a contemporary artist also, I started to think uh, how I could not to let it pass without talk about that. We have a space of speaking. I, I can, I have like here, I'm speaking, you are listening. This is also a, a relation power, a, a power relation, sorry. And what, how could we use it well? I was not, uh, 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 I, I think it was not, uh, oh, sorry, I, I lost, uh, it's very hard to speak, to yeah. do that in English. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we had to talk about that, we could not, we had to use this space to talk about what was happening in Brazil. To, and to think about that, because it's not when we have a show, we don't want just to talk about that, to speak about that, we want to understand before. And uh, always that we start a, a process, we, it's about oh, what I'm, I, I want to think about in this moment, because I will be the next two or three years thinking about this. So uh, it's a curiosity thing that makes make it happen. Uh, so after that, we started to be more political than Philosoph it's philosophy also, but, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, all the shows after 2000, it, this mass in Brazil started in 2013. The, uh, the show we did in 2015 and the others we did after are more political than before. And we, and this illusion, this power of the puppet, this power of this illusion is, is what it's our guns to fight. Is what we can do. I'm not a person that goes to internet to say things. I'm not. Uh, it's, it's my. I, 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 it's the space I have to talk to make pol to talk about political and this is the stage. So we try to do that in the stage and this show. Macunaíma Gourmet was not because I, I, we travel a lot. We don't talk just for the Brazilian public. So uh, we are in the same mess at the end. <laughs> and uh, to, to think about that, I think it's important. I don't know, maybe it's an illusion for me also <laughs> to think that well, uh, we have to think that we what we are doing are important in some way to convince myself <laughs> uh, uh, we we try to do this and uh, the next like we are in the process of a new show and just by the name you can see what is happening we, it's anthropophagic fables for fascist days mm -hmm. <laughs> that we work with uh, uh, the fables of Aesop mm -hmm. and the contemporary philo in the con Brazilian contemporary philosopher who thinks about fascism, 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 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and we are going to do it more and <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, well, is that. That I think I think I, I don't know if I use it all my time or more than my time. Yeah, <laughs> because <you're fine>. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. good. Good. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. It. <laughs> okay. So I thank all the panelists for um, really making a deep dive into the ideas that I had sketched out. I'm gonna come through and give a question for each one of you. And since you all were able to reference each other's work so well, you know, just right here in the moment, if you have any questions you'd like to pose to each other, that would be wonderful too. So starting with Yanni, 
yeah, I get to do a little knitting here. <laughs> so I'm really intrigued with um, the double voiced performance of your Hamlet show. Um, we often have three or you know two or three person operator puppets, but generally we give the task of voicing the puppet to one performer. But with the Hamlet, you have split that, and some of the characters, um, the dialogue is voiced alternately by two. Is it just two, or sometimes even more than that? No, two. Just two. Um, two performers. So I wondered if that is new to this show. I also wondered um, if that's an evolution from the Bluest Eye production, where there were three performers per puppet, um, but they both voiced the puppet and would sometimes stand outside of the puppet and speak uh, separately. So I'll start there, and then I'll knit some more things in. Yeah, I think um, new, maybe not, because uh, uh, if you look back to what I spoke about first with Dalos, that was my first work to uh, ex begin to explore the multiple voices in conflict inside of uh, individual human. Um, <clears throat> I think what may be interesting in the evolution of Hamlet was um, that uh, the original concept that I had was to work with uh, Hamlet as a single person represented by multiple different uh, forces within that person. So that like the, 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 the father, because who is this father, this ghost that comes and says to him, now, you know, I, I mean, imagine the ghost came and said, Hamlet, listen, I was murdered by my brother, but you should let it go. Marry Ophelia, have a great life, and just <laughs> ignore the bastard, you know? No, he didn't do that. He came out and said, you know, avenge, revenge, my foul and most unnatural murder, you know? So then Hamlet is in the, but Hamlet is not a natural murderer. He's torn between this voice of his father and his own very sensitive perception of, what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to set things right? He said, oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set this right. He doesn't know what it means to set something right. He, he has these questions that echo across time and space about what it means to reestablish a balance in his world. So coming back to the original concept was that uh, the, the, that father voice, for me it's irrelevant whether this ghost is a real spook that appears, or whether it is a manifestation of Hamlet's father as he lives in Hamlet's mind. Yes. That, and that Claudius, being this um, power-hungry, is another element of the human being. He represents the, the you know, he, he represents that fat figure that, you know, he's this, you know, the, the one that wants to pull everything to himself. And so we have these different things within us. So the original concept was we had the, the, those, you know, these, these um, driving father figures, and then, you know, who's the Ophelia calling to him, and what is the, what is the Gertrude element, and um, uh, the friends, the, the, the Laertes and the Horatio, and how they uh, call on his, uh, on, on his sense of humanity and balance uh, in different ways at different points in the show. That was the original concept. We went into a creative workshop process. Uh, one of the ways in which it was provoked was because I thought to myself as a, uh, as a puppet person, I feel like a bit of a fraud doing Shakespeare because I'm not like a real proper theater person. So I don't know about Shakespeare and me, you know? And then I had a thought like, okay, I feel like that, and I've got a master's degree and a, <laughs> a first language English and blah, blah, blah. How about all my fellow theater makers in South Africa who, uh, you know, don't have any degree at all, because we have a big community of people who make and create theater who have, cannot afford to go to tertiary education and haven't been through any kind of training, but make extraordinary, very uh, visceral, very gutsy theater all the time. 
how do they feel about Shakespeare? So I was like, okay, let's actually just open this up and have a workshop where we explore owning Hamlet. What does it mean? Let's ask the question. And I got together my sort of, uh, the way that I work often is I surround myself by, with people who know a lot more than I do. So I said, Rosh, come, we're going to make this. Um, Tim, come, uh, Andrew Buckland, come. Let's, let's make a workshop and explore what does it mean to own Hamlet? What does our Hamlet mean? And in that process with 15 young theater makers who didn't have a background, in uh, a, a university background in theater, and myself in the middle of it going, I don't even know what iambic pentameter is. Never mind, how do you, you know, work with it in the theater? So then I, we were all t learning from each other. So I ran the puppetry element. What does it mean to explore the images in Hamlet using objects and so on? And uh, Timothy ran the how do you access the text? How do you... How do you understand how to deliver this, this, the, these words? And uh, Roshina was working with the dramaturgy and the story elements of the thing, and Andrew Buckland was working with a physical performance. And so, and, and so we learnt from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, and that was, that was the plan. But what was unexpected was how much energy and vitality came from the participants. And from that moment on, it became obvious to me that Hamlet could not be about this sort of this voice, this idea that I had in my mind, which was that there would be only these four actors who would speak all the parts and that we would see them unified into one uh, thing. But then from after that workshop, it became obvious to me that the bigger group of people needed to be involved, needed to be speaking. And Siam Tanda, Scott, who is the second voice of Hamlet, is one of those young people. And he learnt, he knows the whole of Hamlet. He knows all the words of Hamlet. And, I, you know, he was delivering Hamlet at the end of that workshop with such power and such beauty that I had to make him Hamlet as well. So the, the, <laughs> the double voice of Hamlet came because two Hamlets were in the room. Mm -hmm. And Mongi, our other Hamlet's not here because of a visa issue. So Mongi and Siem Tanda are the voices of Hamlet. And Tim became the voice of Hamlet. He's now Claudius and Hamlet are the same. Well, that wasn't part of the original concept, but you know, maybe there's something to be said about that. <laughs> but so the, the evolution of the, of the splits rather within the beings inside, the, inside the, the family dynamic really evolved out of the theater making process, mm -hmm. which I love. I love opening the process of creation to the, the people and the things that are in the room because the things bring their own dynamics as well. So yes, it was also present in the bluest eye, but I feel like that's a very long answer to my question. So oh. maybe I shouldn't go on about the bluest eye. The bluest eye keeps getting shelved over there. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk about it again later if we yes. can run to more questions. Yes. Okay. okay. So that's really great. There was some other theory I was going to knit in there, but that's okay. Um, because what you've brought to the table just now is um, kind of our ongoing poking at Descartes for insisting that the self is a monad in opposition to whatever else is out there. And you are bringing in multiple voices in a consciousness that can be multiple, whether that is within the person or as a group of people coalesce to create something. Yes. Yes? Yes. OK, good. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm delighted with the fact that we can leave doors open, mm -hmm. that we can say, well, does it all speak as one person speaking? Ha is, is Hamlet one voice? Is this one human being we're seeing? Or is it, you know, I, I like that there are little, little openings where people can read their interpretation that, that, that provokes them. Uh, mm -hmm. I really do enjoy Great. leaving some questions out there. Yes, so Jonathan, um, I wanted to ask you more about the mind-body centering. Mm. But I just have a personal question first, yeah. which is, have you read Blood Child by Octavia Butler? No, I haven't. I have read some Octavia Butler okay. uh, recently, but not that one. OK, Blood Child is Octavia Butler's pregnant man novel. She mm. is a, or was, a science fiction writer. Um, and it is exactly this kind of symbiosis between a, I guess, a race of beings that um, humans see as large insects. Hmm. I, you know, I don't know how they see themselves. But they have evolved this symbiosis with humans because they cannot propagate themselves. Hmm. And so they inject their eggs into a male human being. Hmm. 
but the process of giving birth to those eggs when they are ready to emerge uh, destroys the male human body. Mm. And yet, being elected to serve that function is a great honor in the society that has developed. Mm. And because you get to have a special, close relationship with these beings who are running everything. And so the story is told from the point of view of one of these men who is looking forward to bearing the child or the, you know, the offspring of this other being. So that was what I was reading in Kitchuri, well, the, um, the show, as if the body were real while I was watching. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. leaving that aside, I, I think maybe since you're a dancer, the best way to go is through process. Mm. And um, as a fellow dancer, I've said this in the last session, in the West, I think we're often chasing transcendence and this sense of connection with whatever the cosmic entity is out there mm. through um, standing outside of oneself ecstasis, which is the root for ecstasy. But as a dancer, I find that the deeper I can go into my cellular awareness of my body, the more expansive that becomes. So if you can talk about your work in mind-body centering a little more, that would, I think, be illuminating for all of us. Uh, yeah, sure, where to begin? Um... I mean, I do, I do particularly like the idea of, of exploring imminence, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's, there's ways in which uh, my, my studies in body-mind centering are, are a bit about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's, it's if, if anybody's familiar with that particular somatic approach, it's, it's very uh, experiential and exploratory. There's, there's a lot about just, um, getting down into specific experiences about what does it mean to, uh, to be in one's liver or to move from the arterial blood versus the, the different quality of moving from the venous blood or um, what is it, well, what does it mean to, to try and experience cellular consciousness to get out of the, um, Cerebral cortex, I guess, the central nervous system in particular. Uh, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, who developed this work, has a has a thing that, that she's been um, kind of more recently um, getting into that feels like a, a really, um, to me, a really fabulous mystery. I, I don't quite know what she's talking about, but I but I keep coming back to it. Uh, she talks about how. <clears throat> Typically, and, and largely in my experience with, with work like that, like body-mind centering, we bring in the central nervous system as a witness to cellular experience, for example. Um, and, and that's a great thing, but that's different yet than actually being in the experience of the cells themselves. So what do we do with that? <laughs> um, for me, I would say that my studies in BMC have been probably the, one of the most influential uh, things for me as an artist for, for developing dance material. Not in a real, I guess just from, from opening up my, my sense of self and sense of experience and, and, and um, you know, we've been talking about like the sense of possibility, the multiplicity of, of self or selves. Uh, I think, you know, everything from just being a dancer and, and having a whole cache of, of things that, that can be like, not about the form of technique, you know, this is, this is ballet movement, this is Cunningham movement, this is capoeira, whatever, um, all of which are, are lovely um, things also, but to, to get into the, um, the mind of the fascia, for example. Um, BMC talks a lot about the mind of, of this or the mind of that. Um, and, and how does it influence me as a mover, as an improviser, or kind of underlaying technical movement to be in the mind of fascia or the mind of cerebrospinous fluid, something like this. Mm -hmm. so, it, so it opens up a lot of possibilities as a, as a mover 
Um, and then as well, choreographing, you know, there's a lot of, of things, I guess, that, that, um, that I've undertaken as, as creating projects and that, that Julia and I have, have done as well in, in uh, collaborating that are about uh, presenting certain kind of challenges to ourselves. Like, what is it, what happens if you have a dancer on a stage that size where you can't even stand up? So immediately, 99% of the vocabulary or the training that, that you have is, um, or that I have in my particular realm of, of dance training gets thrown out the window. And you've got to figure out, well, well what works now, what's interesting, and, and that was a place where I started leaning really heavily into um, being in the cellular mind and trying to move from, um, from fascia, from fluid, from cells, rather than uh, articulating joints or, or being in kind of the, the, the skeletal muscular system or, or, or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I could keep going, but that's probably yeah. enough. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to see if we can link this more concretely to an experience that even the non-dancers will have. Mm. Can you connect it to the breath? Because what I thought was so beautiful in the show, the first 15 minutes, you only see the dancers back, yes? Mm. And the movement is mostly the breath. So how did you choreograph the breath and what prompts are you giving the dancer so that we see the breath traveling through the body in a way that is riveting for 15 minutes. Mm. And then I think since we all breathe, then we can connect with the experience of being in the body through the breath. Yeah, sure. So um, a really a primary exercise from BMC that I can just introduce for you all right now. So we're, we're used to you know, inhaling through the mouth or the nose, goes into the lungs, and the lungs expansion pushes the tissues so you can feel the, you know, you can feel the breath in down into the belly, maybe down into the, the bowl of the pelvis, um, perhaps even farther out. <clears throat> but if you'll imagine with me for a moment that your inhale is coming in through the navel, and from there expanding out through all six limbs, including the head and the tail. Maybe just try, if you want, you can not also. <laughs> but if you like, just try a few inhales, inhaling in through the, through the navel. Feeling that reach of the, of the tissues mm -hmm. going all the way out to the, to the periphery. And on the exhale from the periphery, everything's just going back out through the navel. So to really plumb this, I think it's, it's spending hours with this rather than you know, minutes. But, um, but also I think one of the points of this from the BMC perspective is that this is actually a pattern that all of us experienced for a significant chunk of our life. This is literally how we breathed in utero for um, a big period of time, right? Our, our oxygen as well as food and other things came in through the umbilical cord and uh, that's how we were oxygenated and, and exhaled as well before we had operating lungs. Um, then to kind of transition that, so, so working with those kinds of things can open up like the, the various ways of working, the, the, the experiential things that can, that can directly feed uh, practices. Uh, in this case, what you are seeing, I was working with another image that I can offer. Um, I think we can just maybe take a minute for this. Uh, if you were to imagine every cell of your body not grouped into the tissues that we know, like this is bone, this is ligament, this is organ, et cetera, but imagine each cell of your body as an individual separate discrete thing, like a bird. I think probably this is another thing that's like common in, in popular thought now, the idea of murmuration. We watch like on, go to YouTube and watch the murmuration of starlings, for example, and there's incredible like patterns that happen and there's a whole science behind like how that works. But if you just take a moment to imagine all of your cells murmurating, so they're shifting kind of like in response to each other in these, un to us at least from the outside eye, unpredictable kinds of ways and responding not through the, through the trajectories that we're used to of like, you know, movement travels through a joint in a particular kind of way or whatever. Keeping it really tiny, you know, on the cellular movement.
So this was an exercise that we used that's really foundational to um, what you saw in the first minute or so of the video loop. That's these tiny micro movements. Uh, and, and going a little bit back to what we were talking about earlier about like the, the impossible and how like, okay, we can't really move this way anymore. We, we do have bones and uh, joints and ligaments that, that largely direct how we move. But going into a, a, an experience like that can offer a new quality of movement, despite the fact that we're not actually, you know, just a cluster of non-differentiated cells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that good? Okay. All right. I get to pick on Felix Eduardo now. So um, I think it would be helpful for the audience, many of whom do not know anything about Brazilian history, if you could tell us about the novel that the show is based on. Novel? The is it Makunama? Ah, okay, okay. Yes, and, and maybe how that connects to um, the, how the contemporary situation evolved. Mm -hmm. Well, Makunaima is a very important book in the lit Brazilian literature. Uh, in, in, there is a, a hundred years, a, a 100 years ago, there was a art movement in Sao Paulo uh, with some artists, between them, Mari de Andrade, who wrote Macunaíma. But they, uh, th there is a manifest, you can find that in, in Google, the Anthropophagic Manifest. When they talk about anthropoph anthropophagy, the cannibalism, but in a way like a, cult a cultural uh, cannibalism, mm -hmm. like to a cultural anthropophagic, like how to eat, uh, uh, how to eat the culture of others. So it's like it's Makunaima is a foot, foot, foot futurist. Yes. Futurist uh, uh, novel, but using everything, the Brazilian themes, it's like a collection of Brazilian themes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's, it makes a, a caricature of the, Bra the Brazilians mm -hmm. that we, when we started to this process, the, in the first days, we have seen that we had to destroy this, uh, uh, this, this character more than uh, to destroy because it's really important. It's like a, 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 there is many, uh, there is a, a lot of true in this character, but uh, it's part of a process uh, of construction of identity mm -hmm. of the Brazilians that are not true, in fact, like uh, the, so, but it's a big movement. We don't use in the, the, the show, we use some informations of mm -hmm. the book, of the character, but we really don't, don't use the complete history. It's a very interesting, I recommend it for you. I, I know that there is a translation. I, I know that <laughs> you, you have read it, uh, Blair, sent me a picture, uh, there is a translation uh, of this book in English. Uh, but it's a very important, at, at the same time it makes something, it's not, uh, 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 there is a movie, very important movie made in the 60s also. Uh, and there, it's a collection of a lot of characters, like the giant mm -hmm. who wants to eat Makunaima, mm -hmm. Uh, he's a, uh, oh, it's, I, I don't have words to that. <laughs> uh, uh, like a business man. Mm -hmm. uh, a corporate fat cat. Yeah. <laughs> and there are some informations, like it was, there, there was a giant, very rich, mm -hmm. who enjoyed to eat meat of humans, and there was, uh, he used it to buy that in the Frigorifico Continental. Mm -hmm. So when we started this point, I think it's just in the beginning of the book, when he told about the, the Frigorifico, this, 
this enterprise that sells human uh, flesh. So mm -hmm. it started to flood. So we didn't want to make it completely, but there is a lot of. We who have read the book can recognize it in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't use just that. There is, in the synthesis, there is the, the two characters, moon and sun, mm -hmm. the, with the carnival things. Uh, like the first, the first word told in the show is no nada. Mm -hmm. It's in the nothing, altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from another book, very important in the Brazilian. And after there is a sequence, of very, and who knows the Brazilian literature can recognize because it's like the, the references are from 20 books, just like just one sentence here, one sentence, and it's a collection, but this, this image, because we are talking about the gourmet, mm -hmm. this illusion also, illusion like you feel special when we, eat something that is gourmet, it's prime, it's, uh, mm -hmm. you are, feel special, but it's an illusion, it's, <laughs> it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so this, this lot of references, but the reality comes uh, hard. And the, uh, I recommend it's a book, it's a very interesting, I, I, I cannot imagine how, how to be read this in English, mm -hmm. because even for the Brazilians, there is a lot of words, it's not known by everybody, because there are words from Amazonia and from different regions, mm -hmm. but it's a very important book for, for us, even if we want to destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you. So, um, of course, now we're a little bit behind hand, but it, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. If you would like to come up to the microphones, we'd be very happy to hear from you. We're, everybody's always afraid to be the first. Here comes the brave gentleman, yes, Steve. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you all. Um, I'm fascinated by puppetry's unique relationship with the other performing arts, which are particularly film, music, mime, and dance. Uh, my mentor often preferred to hire dancers over puppeteers to perform in his puppet company. As dancers, can you comment on this relationship? That would be you. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, you know, interesting, I guess I just, I'm so unfamiliar with the puppetry world that I don't have uh, any sense of comparison, really. Um, I mean, it's been, it's been fabulous, and to be, to be doing this process, we're working with Tom for, for a little over three years now, and to be part of this festival has been, um, been wonderful. Uh, I think that one of the things that, that I, I think is maybe somewhat true is that our, our process, um, typically in dance is a lot longer um, than, than certainly what I am mostly familiar with. I mean, I'm speaking in very general terms. I think that you know, pe people are different, and there's, there's theater processes that are quite long, dance processes maybe that are, that are, that are shorter. Uh, but you know, we, I've been developing this work for, for three or four years, um, and we were in rehearsal for, for maybe six months or so. Uh, and I think that, that something happens there with, um, I mean, both of the puppeteers in, in our piece are dancers, and I think there's a certain kind of like understanding of, of kineticism and, and being in one's body um, that, you know, I'm sure puppeteers are all different, uh, <clears throat> but that, 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 that they both had. Uh, and then I think that there's a lot of just time spent in, um, you know, I was talking a little bit about this 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 idea of, of uh, perception of like how the um, how the fork can become an extension of the body. Um, that's leaning again into Merleau-Ponty uh, phenomenology of perception. But I think that that's also probably what happens with potentially at least with puppetry that that you get to the point where it's not like I'm 
you know, manipulating this object and, and it's challenging, mm -hmm. but suddenly I, I'm no longer in, in the controls, but I'm in the puppet. Um, and I think probably, you know, maybe that's just like your years, partly years of being a puppeteer maybe, but, but I think also it's, it's just hours and hours spent um, being in rehearsal and, and working on the same kind of motion over and over again until it becomes uh, myelinated, um, which is honestly and, and, and a bit oddly also what we do as dancers, right? You're, you're being in your own body in a way that further that takes the, the, the body less as a separate thing and more as the thing that you're in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah. But, now, yeah. Okay, great. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm, while the gentleman is coming forward, I'm going to take a moment to, now I can knit in the thing that J Jani made me think of. So can we tackle this question in light of a side conversation that you and Jani were having beforehand about the audience's expectations for different performing arts? Um, and I'm going to connect that to Steve Tillis's work on um, the double vision of the puppet, that um, the puppet stands in between the performer and the audience, and they are experiencing the object together. So um, can you all pick up the thread of what you were talking about earlier about audiences giving you space for um, understanding or not understanding the work? Sure, I mean, I can uh, recap a little bit <laughs> what we were saying. So um, we were just talking about working with puppetry and dance because I've also worked a lot with dancers. Um, in Firebird and Origins and a couple of other creations, which are really word-free dance with puppets. And um, what I was saying was that it's quite interesting that puppetry and dance almost have um, diametrically opposed places where they live in some senses. And I think there are a lot of exceptions, but that uh, because the puppet project is to create life in an inanimate object. What, how we recognize life is through the quotidian, through the everyday, through those little symbols of stuff like a look, a breath. Uh, and, and one of the big projects of dance is to take us out of the everyday, out of the natural body, into a translated body. So when you put those two things together, it can be really challenging to find a space where both can exist beautifully because the puppet wants something to relate to. It wants something, a thread to look at or be in relation with or uh, uh, feel. Or, so there's this automatic narrative that comes with the puppet, narrativeness that comes with the puppet. And, the, and, the, and, and then dance is not necessarily comfortable automatically in that space. I may totally be talking out of turn here. But there's something there that has been very challenging that I've found in working with the two mediums together. And I've also found that it goes over to the, the performers. And I'd like to say from my perspective as a director who works with dancers and puppeteers, that dancers are extraordinary at what they do with their bodies, but puppeteers are extraordinary at what they do with objects. And the creative imagination of somebody like Mongum Tombeni, who I'm really sad that you couldn't see as Hamlet, his, his <clears throat> what he brings as a creative into the space, it, and he's a very physical, very body-based performer, how he takes a piece of, of cloth and starts to translate that as an energy, as a movement, as a feeling. Um, it's, I, I have rarely met a dancer who has that exact uh, capacity to imagine um, in that very specific way that uh, I don't think it has to, be to do with training, but it has to do with the passion, the, the passion puppeteer, the person who's got that crazy mind of living in things. Uh, it's a very unique space of, uh, of being. And then that was the one, and then the other thing is the fact that one of the things that I also trained in fine art originally, and then I came over into theater. That's how I also feel like a theater fraud, because I actually started. <laughs> I just did a master's in theater, but I lacked all the undergraduate training where they teach you all the real stuff, you know? So, so um, in fine art, audiences come to fine art wanting to be provoked, 
and not wanting to understand. Literally, fine, if people come into a fine art experience and they understand, they're, rep they're repulsed. They, they're, what is this? Why are you telling me stuff? You know, a theatre audiences, in my experience, come into a production and they want to understand. If they don't understand, they're like, "Why, why was that so confusing? What does it mean? <laughs> why, why didn't you sh explain to me what was going on?" <laughs> and the dance audiences come into thing and they're like, "Just give it to me." <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> And they're really different. <laughs> so if you start doing like puppetry with dance audiences, the dance audiences are like, whoa, whoa, whoa there's a narrative there. Ah, we don't do that. <laughs> and, then, and then your fine art audience is like, mm. <laughs> and, then, and then you do something like e experimental, provocative with different energies and it's a theater and people are like, whoa, what does that mean? <laughs> so I, I think that, you know, the, the audiences come in with very different expectations. And the unwillingness of theater audiences to trust themselves is a, is, a, is a really, it's a big sadness for me in our contemporary world. We need to just keep pushing it out there. They don't trust their imaginations. They don't trust their ability to make up their own meanings and feel the feelings and allow that to be enough. Um, and I think that also conversely, sometimes the, the drive to remove all narrative from storytelling in, in dance and art can be quite sad because there's so much about our human soul that gets revealed through the relationships that build on each other. So that's just me. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fine. Jonathan. A little two cents about the whole world of it. <laughs> Did you want to <laughs> add on or, or are we ready for the next question? Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe I would just say briefly, I, I, this question, like the question of audience agency comes up a lot for me mm. in this kind of question and, and just feels like a really juicy one and how, uh, for me, I tend to work in, in maybe a place of sort of tension between the narrative and, and the abstract and, and I, 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 I probably lean pretty heavily into a lot of dramatic elements but without having sort of like a clear, like this is the narrative kind of thing. It, it feels interesting when audience can come in with a lot of things that, that, that stimulate or provoke reaction feeling, but, but are left to, you know, a dozen different audience members come out with a different, dozen different interpretations or stories or non-stories or experiences or whatever. Um, but then also that question of like, how do we frame the work in such a way as to invite that, you know, like, can we set up the, the whole experience, not just the material that, that happens on stage, but the whole experience in such a way as to try and invite people into like, oh, this is, this is a non-narrative situation or this is a narrative situation or like, what are the, what are the things that, that, in, that engage uh, the audience in a way that's sort of appropriate to the work, which might be wildly different from one work to the next? Thank you. All right, thank you for waiting. Not a problem. Yes. Um, the only problem is I think I have two questions, but I don't want to hog the microphone. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll take this off. Cause so this is, I think, Eduardo? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say in watching the production that the sensations in me were active pretty quickly, because you were talking about the sensations in creating a puppet. And um, so there's a question there, but I just wanted to say at first that particularly food creates a sensation right away. I think, you know, in, one, in our senses, it comes from so deep in us. And so I was feeling that quite early on when I was watching. So your thought that in creating a large puppet that even five seconds of sensation in the puppet would create, a, as you put it, a hypnotizing kind of experience I guess I'm wondering, as, you, as the performers being aware of what the audience was experiencing as much as you could, do you, were you tracking the sensations? Were you, were, you, were you thinking about other sensations as well as what you were creating with the puppet um, as you were creating the piece? And I say that because I think that it was so powerful and there were ways in which the the mind part of it, the hypnotic part of it, just grew and grew and grew. So I'm just curious how, we, how else you were thinking about sensations throughout the creation of the piece. Well, well I try to give different sensations uh, during the show, but uh, 
Yes, I think each scene, uh, I don't know if I understood very well the question, sorry, mm -hmm. because uh, it's a little bit hard, but, uh, but uh, different sensations, I, I try to organize these sensations uh, uh, to have a big uh, r range, wide range of, of, wide range of sensations. And because I, I think even this show has not this, in, in other show there is like a scene that the public can't breathe. The public, I, a lot of people tell me in the end of the show, and there is a strategy to make this. And there is a moment that really, uh, even because I, I do the soundtracks, normally I do the soundtracks of the shows, and even when I was doing the soundtrack, I, it gives a, it's, uh, and I, I think it's so, I think it's so powerful because if you, I think you, you, the public doesn't expect this from the puppets. And I love this, that the public think the, pu the puppets are beautiful, mm -hmm. are sweet, <laughs> and it's very good to have this expectation. And I like to use that because they are not expecting to feel what they feel. And uh, I, I like, like I know exactly. I try to do in the when I'm writing. Of uh, these, I know I, where I, I have to put the. I have to make the public hate me. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's 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 uh, because they are judging this. They are. I, I'm. Maybe they think, oh, why are he doing that? That we don't like. But yes, it's not to like. It's not uh, uh, like when we do the the philosophy in the bedroom. The other show, the Marquis is sad. Uh, a lot of p people leave the theater. <laughs> And I always ask, when in the show, I, there, I have some, oh, someone from, from the production waiting, counting how many people, and when, <laughs> and when they, they, they left the theater. Because uh, uh, it's not, uh, this, the public are expecting good sensations, good message, message. But a good message, it's not, uh, 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 sweet, always. And uh, I believe really that we, this, we can use the, the puppet to, to make people think, to make about uh, some things. And for me, it's what, uh, what's important, like an artist. I will, I will feel that I'm doing my job not if I leave the public, uh, if the public agree all the time. Because there are, there are a lot of things that is not good to, and we are not, we, we do everything for, don't you think about this? And uh, I think during this show, like, it's terrible, but there, it, it's terrible, I know, it's terrible, it's very, <laughs> <laughs> like when he cracks the the, yes. the, the neck of the puppet, <laughs> I, I can see. I, I was I, I was using a mask that I can see just one small point in the public, and when he did that, there was a guy like, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like that for one minute. I know he was not uh, he was not happy, <laughs> but at the same time he was uh, he was thinking, oh. That's true. Life is like that. Uh, uh, I was talking to you before here. Like the idea in this show was to to make the public think about who I explore to to make to be comfortable to <laughs> use uh, fancy products and and who. Uh, like, who are you eating? 
when you use a special soap that comes from, I don't know, uh, uh, and uh, who are you eating, but who eats you also? Where in this chain are you? Uh, so it was the main objective, main mm -hmm. thing in this show. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope that was satisfactory. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is gonna be our last question. Uh, this is for all three of you, but mm -hmm. uh, especially for Yanni and uh, Eduardo. I haven't seen your show yet, sir. <laughs> okay, but you may be able to answer it too. Uh, I believe it was Yanni who said, living in the object is what great puppeteers are able to do. Okay, you may not have phrased it that way. At what point does the metaphysical or spiritual or spirit of the puppet take over? no matter what you may want it to do? And how does that influence your show or your project? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think it's, a, it's, it's in the space of play where you create, if you're the builder of the puppet, uh, something that is going to be it's going to be moved and it's going to somehow come into being. You don't know how yet. And then you've got these people that you've brought into the room to play with this thing. And then there's this meeting, this encounter. And there are expectations and things that you know, like the bluest eye. <laughs> I made, I built the puppet so that she could come to pieces because it's, a, you know, it's about the fact that she's to her, her psyche is disintegrating, so we see the puppet coming apart, and the and the puppets, you know, puppeteer is forcing her back together or pulling her apart. That is is a plan, but when you bring the thing into the space, and the 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 puppeteers have to grab uh, the pu in order to get the eyes out of the puppet, they have to grab it across the mouth, so that they can hold it properly and get the eyes out. Suddenly, there's this kind of masking and this um, silencing that's happening by the puppeteers of the puppet that is unplanned and that can only emerge as you start to explore how these two things meet, the play of the performer and the, and the object. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Okay. Okay. I, I didn't understand very well so the, the, the question. Sorry, can oh. you help me? Okay. Um, so We've been dancing around the metaphysical uh -huh. um, because even though Graham Harmon and the object-oriented ontology uh, thinkers invite us to um, apprehend, as it were, the agency of the material, mm -hmm. they all stop short at what we would consider to be animism and the idea that there is a spirit in the object. Jackie is mm. raising that mm. question of mm -hmm. animism and do we encounter that mm -hmm. in the puppet? Have you encountered that in your work? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's and this is the illusion that I think it's almost for me even. It's um, it's more more than illusion, more than it's like a magic, really. Mm. Some characters are really, they have their own, like the, yesterday I, I did a, a, in the cabaret, I, I presented a show, it's a show I do, there is 15 years that I present this, this show and it's really a character that he's, he knows what he wants more than me. <laughs> it's like, it's a show with, it's, uh, uh, I never know what is going to happen. I never, never know. Yesterday, before to enter in the, the, the stage, I could not, I, it's that, it's that the play. Uh, uh, and uh, each character, but it, it's also, because it's not the character, the, of course it's a object, but uh, each person, and. I, I, I say to the, 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 the actors in the company that they have to, oh, put your actor side in your arm. That I think there is something here when I take 
uh, the head of a puppet a transfer of energy that may, may be metaphysic. May, I, I don't know what happens. But if I have, I, I, I can't have the same, I, I can't, the character cannot be here in my head. It has to be here. And I have just to transfer that. And I feel really that I'm doing that, like the energy is, is passing. It's a little bit strange, but it's strange to be puppeteer. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, Bruce, I see you. We are at two o'clock. I believe that the live stream shuts down at this point. If anyone needs to leave, you are welcome to do so. Um, I am going to honor our um, living treasure here and entertain his question, if the panelists will bear with me. And. Um, Let's have it, Bruce. <laughs> well, there's a scientific neurological component to, to this, which I'd like to, that is being proven. Uh, illusion uh, uh, comes about through the wish, through the, uh, uh, ah. what's happened now is they have proven neurologically that there is a communication between the audience and uh, the performance, mm -hmm. all performance arts, which uh, involves, comes with a ritual, wishful dis, dis, dispensing of belief. Mm -hmm. And uh, that process creates an illusion that is shared and unites all performances in that respect. Um, this was I got from Peter Brook, the director, and one of the, uh, in his, uh, in, in one of his YouTube things. But what, what's happening is they know scientifically that we are, we unite neurologically with each other. Okay. And uh, these are studies that are going on now which uh, I think really addresses uh, what you were all talking about, that there is a scientific solution or mm -hmm. possible solution okay. to uh, what is experienced, being experienced by anybody involved in a performance that takes them up into another sphere mm -hmm. of a reality. Okay, thank you so much. Thank the panelists. Thank all of you for being present. And that is the end of this session. <laughs>